Okay, so we're still in chapter 10. We're still talking about, um, about series, but we're going to pivot and we're going to talk about a new type of object called a power series. And what makes a power series a new type of object is that a power series is a function. We're going to use infinite series to define functions. In particular, to define functions that look like P of X equals the sum from zero to infinity of a sub n, x to the power of n. And our intuition about our series should be that they are infinite polynomials. So this has the form a sub zero plus a sub one x plus a sub two x squared plus a sub three x cubed. This has the form of a polynomial, but a polynomial stops at some point. You get to a sub n x to the power of n, where n is the degree of the polynomial. The power series never stops. It is essentially an infinite degree polynomial. And power series are going to be the real major application of these infinite series. They're extremely important. And um, I want to look ahead a bit because in this class, we do sometimes go so long without really looking at application. And we're still not going to be looking at applications yet, but I would like to try to get some idea about why we care about these power series, about what makes them important. And um, let me make a completely obvious statement that not all functions are polynomials. As I say, completely obvious, barely seems worth mentioning. For example, f of x equals the cosine of x. There is a trig function. It is not a polynomial. However, Continuous functions and be approximated. With polynomial. So, 
This is a well-known, I mean, well-known fact in one sense. It might be the first time you've seen this fact. Let's go to Desmos, new share. Let's make it so our, so this shows up in the recording. And let's see if we can approximate this non-polynomial function, the cosine of x with a uh, polynomial. And we'll see by the end of this semester, in fact, by next week, where this polynomial I'm using is coming from. But let's just look at one minus x squared over two. If we're zoomed in so that we're looking at values of x near zero, this polynomial is doing a pretty good job of looking just like the cosine. I mean, aside from the fact that they're different colors, I mean, a red blue color blind student could not tell with these graphs apart. But of course, you can see that this approximation is only any good close to x equals zero. Once we get a little far away from zero, this uh, polynomial curve and this cosine look nothing like each other. Well, it turns out that we can make the approximation better by adding more terms to the polynomial. So I added an x to the fourth term, and we went from this. So here, you see these um, curves don't look like each other around this negative 1.4. We added another term and suddenly around this negative 1.4, these curves look a lot like each other now. And I mean, you can probably recognize the pattern. We have even powers and we have factorials. Again, we'll talk about where this comes from later. But the point I want to make is that as we increase the degree, As we increase the degree of this polynomial, it's doing a better and better job of approximating the cosine. So we ask ourselves, well, what if we just didn't stop? I mean, what if we just kept going forever and created an infinite degree polynomial, created a power series? Well, it looks like if we were able to keep going forever, if we were able to have an infinite degree polynomial, then this might stop being just an approximation, and they might actually start being equal to each other. And that idea is correct. And it's the main application of this series material that we've spent the last two weeks or whatever looking at.
most. Let me put this in parent. Let me uh, qualify this. I'll have things to say about that word most down the line. But most continuous functions can be written as power series. So for Again, this is not an absolutely universal statement. That word most is there. But if we have a continuous function, there's a very good chance we can write it as an infinite polynomial as a power series. Um, and I've said this is an application of, um, of power series, but is it really an application? I think, I mean, the word application suggests we should be able to use it to do stuff. And our intuition is probably at this point that infinite series are harder to work with than finite functions, right? I mean, the cosine of X is a function we learn about maybe in high school geometry or high school trigonometry. It's not that complicated. So why would we want to replace it with an infinite quantity, with an infinite sum? Well, first of all, I mean, the first answer is that in practice, we usually, if we're using these power series, we're usually replacing a function with a finite sum. Like suppose we're interested in values of X that are close to zero. So we're doing astronomy. And in astronomy, you have a binary star system. And then you have us on Earth. And we want to look at the angle between that um, these lines of sight form. There's an application. Um, Looking at this angle gives us information about how bright the stars are and so on. Well, this angle is going to always be very close to zero, like 0 0.00017 or something like that. So say that going into a problem, We know something about this angle. We know that it's close to zero. Then, you know, here, that can I go even further? Go even further there. If we know that the angle is close to zero, then this function, the cosine of x, is very closely approximated by just the first two terms of the series. It's very closely approximated by one minus, minus x squared over two. 
And I've said that the cosine of X isn't really a complicated function. I've said it's something we learn about in high school, maybe. But one minus X squared over two is a really simple function. We learn about quadratics before high school. So the idea of power functions is that if we have a semi-complicated function or a very complicated function, we might be able to replace it with a simple polynomial. So this is an approximation technique, essentially. So this is what our functions kind of are for. And we can talk immediately about an application of this, um, which is that doing calculus with polynomials is simple, right? I mean, if I asked for the integral of x squared plus x minus one. Everyone in this room could do that, I trust. Um, so polynomials are nice when we're doing calculus. Suppose we're trying to do calculus with <laughs> with a function that isn't nice. Suppose we want the integral of the sine of x squared, let's say. Um, well, we, at, we, we can't take this using any of the techniques we learned in the first half of this class. Not substitution, not parts, not trig substitution, not a trig integral, not anything. But we think, what if we could rewrite this sine of x squared as a polynomial. Well, that's a pipe dream, but what if we could rewrite it as an infinite polynomial? Well, taking the integral of a polynomial is simple, so it certainly wouldn't surprise us if taking the integral of this infinite polynomial was also simple. That is, it seems like it might be true that we can take this integral in a very simple way. So this is going to be the primary application of power series that we're going to look at. We have a function. We want to do calculus with the function. We want to take integral. But we can't. The function is too complicated. None of the techniques we learned um, in chapter eight work. So we rewrite the function as a polynomial and a polynomial in scare quotes, an infinite degree polynomial. And then we do a couch to this with that infinite degree of polynomial. That is going to be the primary application. I'm repeating myself, I guess, 
but this is going to be the primary application of power functions in this class. And now that we, um, now that we have some background, I mean, now that we hopefully are convinced that I'm not just presenting this stuff to bother you, but that it's actually usable for something, let's take a step back and let's provide some sort of introductory material about our functions. So we can, the first statement I'm going to make isn't even really a hook to this statement, but we can add and subtract and even multiply to our series. And now I'll put this in quotation marks in the natural way. So that might actually be a little cryptic sounding when I say it like that. But suppose instead of these infinite power series, we had finite polynomials. We have one X cubed, plus x squared minus x plus one. And we have q of x, two x squared plus three x plus two. And we wanted to do some addition. We wanted to add these polynomials together. Well, to add finite polynomials, we add like terms. So this Q of X, we don't have a cubic term written down. The cubic term is zero. So we add the one, from P of X and the zero from Q of X to get the cube term. And to get the square term, we add the one from the X squared and we add the two from the two X squared. And to get the linear term, to get the X term, we add the negative one and the positive three. And to get the constant term, we add the constant terms, one and two. So that's how we do addition with finite polynomials. Again, we add the common terms. We add the constant terms, we add the linear terms, we add the quadratic terms, and so on. And with this in mind, um, we can add 
our functions in precisely the same way. So now instead of finite polynomials, let's not skip any terms. We have our series that go on forever. There is an infinite power series. And we have another power series. It goes on forever. Uh, I should have, whatever, I didn't write these on so that they were aligned. Um, and if you want to add these power series to get a new power series, well, you add the, line, the constant terms, and you add the linear terms, and you add the quadratic terms, and so on. I mean, I don't want to get tedious. We probably probably get the point by now. We add the cubic terms. And of course, this process never stops. It's an infinite process because we have infinitely many terms but that's how the sum of a power series is defined. And subtraction in the same way. We, we sub, does anybody want to see subtraction or can I say that then everyone sort of gets the point? Uh, multiplication of power series is done in the natural way. Again, putting that in scare quotes. I mean, that's what I that's what I wrote here. But multiplication is trickier in general because I mean, multiplying <laughs> polynomials is time consuming. Right? If you have two 10 degree polynomials and you want to multiply them together, you better have plenty of scrap paper because it's going to be an enormous process. Still, it, it works the same in a general way. I mean, even if doing it, is pretty uh, inconvenient and difficult. I mean, let's remind ourselves how how we would multiply these polynomials. Um, this is going to be a six degree polynomial. And um, to do polynomial multiplication, you do a bunch, and I do mean a bunch of smaller multiplications. And then you take all of these smaller products 
and you add them all together. <clears throat> let's look at the result. And let's look at the result piece by piece. Does the result of this product have a constant term? Well, the answer to that is yes, one times two will give us a constant term. Does this product have an X to the first term? It has, it does. Um, one times three X will give us three X and two times X will give us two X. And we're going to have a five X term in the product. Does the product have an X squared term. Yes, and, and again, we just look, let's see, x times 3x will give us 3x squared. 1 times x squared will give us 1x squared. And you can yell out if you think I'm wrong, but I believe those are the only multiplications that will give us an X squared. So we'll get a four X squared. And I'm not going to finish this because it's very boring and you probably get the point, but one last term. Does this product have an X cubed term? Now we've got a one minus X cubed. And we've got an X times an X squared. That gives us an X cubed. And we've got a negative X cubed times two. That gives us a negative two X cubed. So this product will have an X cubed term in it. And you just build up the product in this way. You find the X to the fourth term. I won't write this down, but to find the X to the fourth term, you look, well, what could give you X to the fourth um, here? X times negative X cubed will give us an X to the fourth term. Negative X cubed and three X will give us a negative X to the fourth term. And I think those are the only ones. X to the fifth, you just look Let's see, this negative X cubed and that X squared are the only terms that are going to give us X to the fifth. X to the sixth, negative X cubed and negative X cubed will give us an X to the sixth. And that's the product. Uh, pretty tedious, even with these uh, relatively low degree of polynomials, I have to admit. What if you want to multiply? An infinite power series.
by another infinite power series. Well, exactly the same process. X well, exactly is pushing it. It's the same process, except that it doesn't end because all of these things are infinite. But you can ask, does this product have a constant term? And yes, you have two times one, that gives you a constant term. Does it have an X term? So you have two times negative X and you have X times one. So there's a negative X term. Does this product have an X squared term? Let's see. Two and negative, nope. Let's try that again. Two and three X squared. Six X squared. X and negative X, negative X squared, negative X squared and one. So there's a four X squared term. And you keep building the product in this way. And when you see this again, you're probably thinking, I must be, I mean, I've said, oh, we can do count to this this way. This like, seems so complicated, probably, like I must be lying to you. But again, let's go to our motivating example here. If X is near zero, and we want to approximate the cosine of X using a power function, we only needed two terms, right? We needed one minus X squared over two. And already this approximation is so good that we can't visually see the difference between this trade function and this approximating polynomial. So, I mean, the secret here, well, it's not a secret, but the thing that makes this usable, the thing that makes this useful, is that you're not usually going to be finding, like, what's the x to the tenth term, let's say. We're usually looking for three, maybe four terms, and that will be good enough for our purposes. Just like here, I guess properly speaking, we have three terms instead of two, but three terms is giving us a very good approximation here. So, you know, granting that this gets very tedious or it could get Tedious. And if we wanted to then to compute, as I say, like what's the X to the 10th term, that would be a headache. But we almost certainly don't want the X to the 10th term. We usually want to just build up the first few terms and that's all we need. Questions. I mean, I know we haven't really learned new techniques or anything like that, so it might be hard to formulate questions at this point. Um, we can do couch to this with our series in the natural way as well. 
I mean, I sort of made an assumption back here, right? That if we know how to do calculus with a finite polynomial, we can do calculus with an infinite polynomial. That is, we, that we can integrate the power series just like we integrate a polynomial. And, and that's a true assumption that I was making. If, if we want to differentiate a power series, We do so in the natural way. We differentiate the first term, we differentiate the second term, we differentiate the third term, we differentiate the fourth term, and so on. We take the derivative of an infinite polynomial, just like we take the derivative of a finite polynomial. And more to the point, for most applications, integration. To integrate a infinite polynomial, to integrate a power series, we deal with it just as we would deal with a finite polynomial, which is just to go down the line and integrate each of these terms piece by piece or one by one. So we take these powers that I, ah, yes, I was in a rush and never mind. I'll just erase this four and replace it with a three. So we integrate a sub zero, we integrate a sub one X, we integrate a sub two X squared, we integrate a sub three X cubed, and so on. And I should say that this, um, this is a process, our series are special. Um, because it's perfectly possible to create other functions using infinite series, right? I mean, there's nothing stopping me from writing f of x equals the sum from zero to infinity of the sine of x divided by um, n factorial, right? This isn't a power series. And I cannot do calculus with it in a natural way. I cannot take the derivative of this function just by taking the individual derivatives. I cannot integrate this function by taking the individual integral. So power series are special. They have properties that a function like this doesn't. Let me state the next topic, uh, the topic that we'll get to at some point this week, um, either tomorrow or Wednesday or Thursday, depending on what the 
whether and the system office decide they want to do. We've talked about um, convergence. A series can converge or it can diverge. So, say that we have a power series. Um, we still can talk about divergence and convergence, but because we have this variable x, the situation is going to be a little different from the situations we've been looking at because a power series can converge for some values of x, but diverge for other values. So we can't really talk about a power series being convergent or divergent. Because whether a power series converges or diverges depends on the value x. So instead of talking about a power series converging or a power series diverging, we have to talk about well, we've got this power series. Here are the values of X it converges for. Here are the values of X it diverges for. And the technique that we're going to use here, 99 times out of 100, we're going to investigate with this with the ratio test. Remember that I said the ratio test works really well if you have powers because stuff cancels if you have powers and uses and use the ratio test. Well, we're going to see that here as well. We'll investigate when power series converge and when they diverge using the ratio test. And we'll do that. Again, it's hard to say um, what the weather is going to do, but we'll, I certainly, I trust we'll have at least one more lecture this week, hopefully more than one, and we'll, uh, we'll do that then.